see this turn out. Uh, I'm Kevin Doherty. I'm a member of Ford Not Back, uh, the Indivisible Chapter in Highland Park. Um, I wanted to uh, let you know that this forum on the Green, Green New Deal is part of a series that is actually going to be occurring over the next month or so. On April 23rd, there's going to be a discussion of New Jersey's fiscal crisis and problems with its tax system. It's going to be at the Metuchen Reform Church. It's sponsored by um, Indivisible uh, uh, Central Jersey, Central New Jersey, and Ford Not Back. And the speaker will be Sheila Reinertson of uh, New Jersey Policy Perspective, who's a particular expert in budget and taxation issues in New Jersey. And then May 1, we're going to be having a voting rights forum here at the Reformed Church, and uh, sponsored by Ford Not Back, uh, Indivisible Central New Jersey, and endorsed by the New Brunswick Area uh, NAACP. And the speakers are going to be Ron Pierce, a uh, Democracy and Justice Fellow at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, Jesse Burns, Executive Director of the New, Jer New Jersey League of Women Voters. And that's going to be Wednesday, May 1st, 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, and we'll be getting word out uh, about this to you. Um, before we, I get into a little bit of the substance, I just want to give some thanks to the people who helped pull this together. Um, particularly members from Ford Not Back, Josh Hankson, Beth Stevens, Heather Theringer, John Rumbaugh Gardenberg, and Michael Buckman. And uh, Beth and, and Heather are at the back of the room. They're the ones taking names. Um, Josh, where are you? Okay, over here. Um, Joan? Okay, back there. Is Mike Buckman here? I think Mike might, might have been out of town. Um, and um, also, uh, I want to talk about you know, the support that we received from Indivisible Central New Jersey. Um, and several of their members are here as well. Um, I see Beryl Copeland, if she could put up her hand. Paul Nadler, uh, any other member from there? Okay, several other people. And also from Monroe, uh, Indivisible, could the people from there put up their hands? Okay, so thank you. We really appreciate your coming. Um, in any case, let's talk very briefly. The reason we wanted to have this session on the Green New Deal is that the concept of the Green New Deal laid out in the House Resolution by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Edward Markey provides us with an opportunity to address several fundamental issues facing our country. Intensifying climate change, increasing income and wealth inequality, persistent racial inequality, and increasing threats to democratic deliberation in our country. So it provides a way of knitting together these various issues. At the same time, the concept is a sketch of a full program, and there are a lot of questions about how it would work. So we're very much hoping that our speakers will provide us an opportunity to start thinking about the strengths and the areas needing, uh, needing further um, uh, filling out and maybe change in the Green New Deal. Um, to examine it, we have several compelling speakers who will be examining the environmental, jobs, and racial justice aspects of the Green New Deal proposal. We've asked the panelists each to speak about 10 minutes apiece, and then they'll be addressing some questions posed to them by our moderator, and then we'll be opening up to Q&A. And our, our moderator will be introducing the panel. Um, my task is only to introduce him. So uh, I'd like to, over here at the other end of the table, uh, Randall Solomon, Executive Director of Sustainable Jersey, who um, uh, will be introducing you to the speakers in turn, but I asked him if he could begin by talking a little bit about himself and the organization. And before I forget, there's one last person I also want to thank for very much helping us in pulling this together, and that's Melanie McDermott down here. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Again, my name is Randy Solomon. My organization is Sustainable Jersey. I'm here today as a resident of Highland Park, um, <coughs> public citizen. Uh, but my organization, Sustainable Jersey, we're going to be talking a lot about the national level, and I imagine some about what's happening in New Jersey at the state level. Um, my organization focuses at what can happen and should happen at the local level. And so, um, in addition to whatever you take away from this and translate into political activism, 
at the state and federal levels. I also you encourage, encourage you to think about um, where you live and what you can do to advance uh, uh, advance the fight against climate change um, and everything else that is in the Green New Deal at the local level. And you can go to sustainablejersey.com. And we've got the specific policies, plans, ordinances, campaigns that we think cities and towns in New Jersey need to implement uh, to do their part to combat climate change. And so I encourage you to check that out. So enough about me. Um, without further ado, um, introduced on February 7th, 2019, sponsored by Representative Ocasio-Cortez, Democrat, New York 14th Congressional District, is House Resolution 109, recognizing the duty of the federal government to create a Green New Deal. So today's panel, we are going to talk about what is in the Green New Deal, the specific provisions. What are the political ramifications of the Green New Deal? And what can be done to support the aspirations of the Green New Deal and House Resolution 109 itself? Our excellent panelists tonight, um, to my right, we have uh, Ed Potosnik, who is, uh, he wrote a nice bio for me, but I think I know him well enough that I don't have to read it, but um, he's currently the Executive Director of the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters. Um, he is one of the leaders in the state on a number of environmental coalitions focusing on energy, water, climate, and a number of different things. He got his start as a teacher, a chemistry teacher, I believe, um, and then was lucky enough to translate that into thinking about policy in Washington, D.C. as it relates to energy and prosperity, and then Hocus Pocus, running for Congress, and here you are today, right? Pretty much. Pretty much. Okay. Um, and then uh, farther down at the, the far end, we have uh, Todd Vachon. Todd's a former union carpenter who returned to college during the Great Recession to pursue an advanced degree. And while studying at the University of Connecticut, he helped organize the Graduate Employee Union um, and served as the founding president from 2015 to 18. From that position, he merged his concerns for labor rights and climate protection by becoming the, uh, the local UAW's liaison to the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs, um, broad-based coalition, and he's currently on the faculty of the School of Management and Labor Relations at Rutgers, and he serves on the steering committee for the Labor Network for Sustainability, which is a national network of labor leaders and activists constituting a progressive labor, labor front on climate issues. And his research focuses on the intersection of climate change and work and employment, with special attention to just transitions, which is very pertinent to today, and efforts to ensure that green jobs are good jobs. Um, and then a late substitution, Lorene Bowles from the Environmental Justice Alliance was ill today, and so uh, very competently subbing in her place is uh, someone I've known for a very long time, Dr. Nikki Sheets. Um, Nikki's got a doctorate in Earth and Planetary Science, and he's a member and one of the leaders of the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, um, and his uh, full-time job is as the director of the Center for the Urban Environment at the Watson Institute for Public Policy at Thomas Edison State College. Um, he is uh, a leader of uh, a lot of coalition-type efforts in New Jersey and also at the national level, um, including being a member and participant of the uh, a national group, which is the EJ Leadership Forum. Uh, he's on the steering committee and the Environmental Justice Science Initiative. So um, let's have a brief round of applause for our panelists. So, so the format for tonight, you all are part of the conversation. And despite the fact that we are way up here on high, um, we intend to give our 10 minutes each and then turn it over um, to you all for discussion. As we, um, uh, I'll, I'll ask people to, to ask questions, and given the fact that there are a lot of people and not a ton of time, um, I'll apologize in advance so that if someone's giving a speech, I can cut you off um, to let the next person be able to get in their, their bit as well. Um, but um, as quickly as possible, try to turn it into a conversation. So our key questions and themes for tonight for all of you and for the panelists, um, I'd like I prepared some and I'm going to read them. I apologize for, for reading for so long, but um, it's been said that the Green New Deal is an aspiration, 
and a set of goals, and not traditional legislation with specific policies and laws. So let's review. What are the key findings, targets, and aspirations in the Green New Deal? What's the prognosis for House Resolution 109? What will the impact of the Green New Deal be on politics in the future and on future policy debates? The Green New Deal is not just the Green Deal or the New Deal. Why did the framers link social and economic justice with environmental sustainability and climate change? Is there a critical relationship there? And good or bad, what are the practical, political strategy implications of forging that link? Left-leaning critics of the Green New Deal say that it's Pollyannish, establishment Democrats, and can never be passed. In the minds of the sponsors, what is the strategy and the theory of change behind the Green New Deal? A criticism that has been leveled against Democratic Party elites is that they've shrunk the window of politically plausible policies by self-censoring strong progressive policy positions to win elections. How should climate advocates balance the need to win elections and the need to dramatically shift the policy debate so that includes strategies that are actually up to the challenge of climate change. And finally, the Green New Deal harkens back to the original New Deal, which came at a moment of great turmoil and transition. Are we at a similar historical moment? What illuminating parallels can we draw from history? And in the past, how has the implausible become practical? And what can we, what can we learn from those past moments? Um, and when the, the panel is done, uh, and Kevin, uh, if, if you're interested also, um, we'd like to blend into the conversation um, what needs to happen in the U.S. and U.S. politics and society, and the aspirations of the Green New Deal to become a reality, um, and then also uh, what, what can you all do should you choose to act on that. And so without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Ed Pazner. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, I want to thank Kevin, Randy, and everyone who made tonight possible. But I also want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, we really are at a critical juncture in time, as everyone saw from the IPCC report most recently. Um, time is running out to act on climate change and to make sure we protect the world we love, but our neighborhoods and our communities and our way of life, farming, for sustenance, for future generations. So um, it's really great to be here. and. I think um, there's going to be a lot to cover in all those questions, and I'm going to try to give you a little bit of an overview of sort of three aspects, which is who are we as an organization, sort of what is the New Green Deal, what's been happening in New Jersey, and what else is there left to do at the state and federal level. And I'll try to do that um, with a little bit of an eye on my experience working on Capitol Hill for a member of Congress after a decade in the classroom. So I was an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow, um, which takes math and science teachers and places them in Washington, D.C. to take their practical experience working with students in an education policy and inform policy. Um, on education, I worked also on the environment, on climate change, uh, interior, and then appropriations. So how do we spend our money, which our budget is our values. Uh, before I went down there, I didn't know how government worked. I was a chemist and a biology minor, um, and I, I learned a lot about that, and now in my day job at New Jersey League Conservation Voters Education Fund, where we work to empower the electorate, Republicans, Democrats, and independents to make their voices heard on the environment, um, I've taken those skills to, to really get us to a different place. Uh, we work on everything from open space preservation to making sure we have clean drinking water and we reduce flooding through um, other aspects of climate change. Um, so the 100% clean energy goal that New Jersey has, our wind expansion, all things that fall into our portfolio. Um, we also work with state legislators. So New Jersey legislature is made up of 40 legislative districts, and in each one there's a senator and two assembly people, and they share the same geography. And we hold them accountable by uh, evaluating legislation and promoting legislation, and then when they vote, we grade them. We put out a scorecard uh, to inform voters before they go to the polls on 
who's the best on the environment or not. So if you're good and you like the environment, you're going to vote for the ones that are good. If I guess you don't like the environment, you can vote for the ones that are bad. Um, but that's all part of the, the work that we do uh, to hold these elected officials' feet to the fire and also educate them about the important issues that we all care about. So that's about us. I guess we can go to the next slide. So the New Green Deal has gotten a lot of attention recently. I think that's why we're all here. Um, it's a very ambitious proposal. And if you haven't had a chance to, to look at it, um, I would recommend, recommend that you, you pull it up. It's, it's not super long, it's 14 pages. It's written in your standard, although I spilled water on this one on the way in, so it's a little wrinkly, um, but congressional sort of uh, format. Um, it's skinny, takes up a ton of paper, it's total waste. Usually they don't print it double-sided, it's even more wasteful. Uh, but you can look it on your computer screen. And um, it's, it's numbered in their lines. Uh, by way of background, uh, a House resolution uh, is every bill that Congress passes called a House resolution. It gets a little confusing because this is actually a resolution and not a bill uh, to make a law. So this expresses basically the ideals or a sense of the House. And it has a whole bunch of really great background on why they feel they need to speak out, and that's all good stuff. And then in the rezo part, as we call it, now therefore let it be resolved, it is the sense of the United States House Representative that and that's where it outlines different provisions of the belief system if it were to be passed of the United States Congress, the House of Representatives. Okay? Um, one of the main tenets is to set a goal for 100% clean, renewable energy by 2030 for the United States. And uh, just clean energy and renewable energy, they sound sort of interchangeable, but they're really not. Renewable energy is energy from like solar and wind, and it, it comes back. In New Jersey, renewable energy includes, includes burning trash, incineration. So by definition, in New Jersey, renewable energy includes burning trash. But that's not clean, right? So the fact that it talks about both clean and renewable is a really good thing, because it captures the best of the best of the kind of energy that we need to protect our health and also address climate change. It has obviously gotten some attention, both in the positives and negatives. Um, and you know, we're gonna probably have a chance to chat a little bit about that. Um, I, I think it's really critical to go over some of the main aspects. So I highlighted them, them here, and they're not really gonna appear in the, um, in the slideshow. But one of the things it talks about, and I, and I know other speakers will adjust it, is a fair and just transition for all communities and workers. So fair and just for all communities and all workers. When we talk about just transition, we're looking at the folks that are working in, let's say, the oil and gas industry or coal miners and saying, your job is going to go away, potentially, under the Green New Deal if it were to be enacted or parts of it were. So we have to make sure that we take you into consideration that you can have a good job going forward. Same thing with uh, communities where we, we install infrastructure, that we're looking at the needs of those communities and we're making sure that we're protecting them and their families going forward. And that's sort of a highlight of that. It talks about creating good high wage jobs. I say good local jobs. It talks about union jobs, which works in a state like New Jersey, but in states with not a lot of unions, that could ruffle some feathers. So, um, you know, just something sort of to flag. Um, it, it talks about um, meeting that 100% uh, threshold through zero emission sources. So those would be um, no carbon giving off uh, in, when they're creating the energy. Um, I highlighted uh, some things around transportation. This is pretty comprehensive stuff. 50% um, of the greenhouse gases in New Jersey come from the transportation sector. So if we don't address that, we're going to fall behind. In addition, um, some other highlights talk about hazardous waste and making sure um, that we're able to uh, addre address uh, water quality issues. Um, there's only a couple more pages left. Um, let's see here. The part that I had that I thought was the most important and the one that probably got the most attention um, was guaranteeing a job with a family sustaining wage 
adequate family and medical leave, leave, paid vacations, and retirement security to all people in the United States. Did anyone hear that as a criticism of the New Green Deal? Right? We all heard that. Um, and it's one piece of a much larger picture about how to address um, climate change. And the, the overall theme is, can we actually address climate change while doing all the other good things that we all believe in? And I think most of us that are here say yes, not just in an aspirational way, we're doing that in New Jersey. And so I'm gonna forward on to the next slide where I can tell you a little bit about what we've done uh, most recently in our state. Um, the legislature joined by Governor Murphy has, is this slide four, is that right? Wow, well, okay now this There you go. Um, Governor Murphy and the New Jersey legislature has enacted a law that by 2030, New Jersey will get 50% of its energy from class one, that's not incineration, solar and, and wind renewables. So that's not as ambitious in the new green, as, as the New Green Deal, but that's a big step from where we are now, which is roughly around 5%. In addition, um, we're working on a, a, the Global Warming Response Act, which reduces greenhouse gas emissions from every sector, including transportation, which is a, a really big contributor. He, the governor has called for a full ban on fracking in the Delaware River Basin. Um, he's also, just this year, reduced the clean energy rates that have been taken out of the societal benefits charge um, so that they can go back into uh, weatherization in homes and helping. The best energy to save is the energy you don't pay for um, because you don't need it because you've got insulation and, and all kinds of things in your house. So energy efficiency is a really important uh, aspect. Then you go to the next slide. So how does this relate to New Jersey? Um, well, it's going to raise the bar for us. You know, this is a competition. When the Clean Renewable Energy Bill was signed into law, New Jersey was at the top of the country in being the boldest to address climate change. And in just a few weeks, California had to outmaneuver us. So when states are competing, when the federal government is in the game, we can make a ton of progress. Um, in addition, if you go forward one more, um, some things on the horizon, you know, when we're thinking about where we go from here, uh, electric vehicles are an important component for us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Anyone here drive an EV? A partial EV? Okay, we've got one. I guarantee two, three. I guarantee if we come back here in five or six years, we'll have a lot more hands. But New Jersey and the rest of the country has to build infrastructure to support a, a change. You think about how many gas stations we have, how many Mavis's and SPS's and all these things. <laughs> we don't need to change our oil in an electric vehicle, but we do need some places to charge. So that's going to be really important. Um, there's a goal in New Jersey to get 330,000 EVs on the road by 2025, so just in the next six years. We're currently at about 20,000 cars. So that's a, a big change for sure over time. Um, in addition, we're working on an electric school bus campaign. So I'm on the school board in Franklin Township, just next door. Um, and I think it's pretty terrible when kids go to school and have to suck in diesel fumes. In addition, buses are big, and they're only used 180 days a year. So if we electrify them, they can be part of our storage, which is an important component of when we're producing uh, energy during the day from the sun, we store it for use uh, maybe on a cloudy day. Um, so th that uh, provides a lot of options. There's some Volkswagen settlement money. If you drove a Volkswagen and they lied to you about emissions, um, New Jersey's getting some of that money, and it can be used in these different ways for electric vehicles and for uh, electrifying our school buses. And then the last thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention before I pass the microphone over and we get a chance to have a discussion, um, we're a voter organization. So in our name, New Jersey League of Conservation Voters, um, is the core of what powers the change that we see. And so I know you all know this, but I'll just mention, it's really important not only to vote, but to help engage communities in voter registration, vote by mail registration, and making sure that people are registered, know where to go, and vote. Because when we vote in New Jersey, the environment wins. And we've seen that in the most recent election with Governor Murphy, and we see that continually in our analysis. Um, so the most important thing I could say and leave you with in all 10 minutes is let's make sure we're doing everything we can to activate our democracy and get people voting with the environment in mind when they come come out to the polls. And then we'll see the sweeping changes as outlined in the New Green Deal really take hold. And it, it, we just don't have enough time to wait.
So that's, the, that's me for now. Hi folks, how's everybody doing tonight? Do, does anybody mind if I come down a little bit? Because I want to use some slides and I kind of, or maybe I can do it from here. I need to be able to see the slides. So um, I'm a sociologist by training. So one of the things you learn when you go to college for sociology is the way that you reveal the unspoken social rules is you break them. So like getting up and being kind of funky, I can see what people looking at me like, what the hell's wrong back uh, So yes, yeah, so I'm Todd Vachon. I'm actually uh, new to New Jersey. I just relocated from Connecticut this past August, and I'm on the faculty of the Department of Labor Studies and Employment Relations at Rutgers. Uh, I also have a very long history involved in the labor movement in Connecticut. I'm the son of a union carpenter and an 1199 healthcare worker. I was a union carpenter myself. Um, and as was mentioned in the introduction, I helped to organize the UAW Local of Graduate Assistance while I was at UConn. Uh, so having said all that, my talk today is going to focus specifically on the jobs and labor parts of the resolution, which Ed touched on a bit. And it was a great summary, by the way. Thanks for going through the whole thing. We needed that to set the stage. Um, so if you want to click to the next, the title I put there was that we're at a moment of dual crisis. It's a dual crisis of ecology and of inequality, right? And these two things are inherently interconnected. Uh, I think for too long in our movement structures, we've been isolated, we've been um, siloed, where environmentalists were looking exclusively at the environment without considering its impacts on jobs, workers, and vulnerable communities. Likewise, those of us in labor were guilty of, you know, doing whatever we could do to get good jobs and not being cognizant of how that might be ecologically ruinous. So this is a, a chart that uh, was in the Guardian newspaper in England a couple months ago, or a couple weeks ago. And what it is, is the nine processes that are essential for life to exist on Earth. And of the nine, four of them are now in the zone of danger, past safe limits. So we can go to the next slide. One of them is climate change. Next. Yeah. Is that going? Ah, <laughs> oh, there we go. So these are probably charts that everybody's familiar with. We all know climate change is real, right? Global temperatures have been rising decade after decade after decade. Um, and it's largely due to our burning of fossil fuels, which that chart on the right is just showing the fossil fuel consumption, uh, fossil fuel uh, into the atmosphere from 1900 to 2014. So it started to spar uh, spike up sharply after World War II as we developed our suburbanized, car-driven economies. Uh, with mass electrification, consumerism, high levels of consumption. All of that economic growth that created the middle class and prosperity also created the climate catastrophe that we're now facing. Next slide. So something else that people may not be aware of is that during this same period, the blue line is the share of all income in society that's going to the top 1% of wage earners. So if you're looking right here, you know what year this is? Anybody want to guess? Way back in history? 1929, right? Right before the Great Depression. If you saw the Robert Reich film, you're probably familiar with this little like bridge thing. So at that point, the 1% were bringing in 23% of all the income. It was highly unequal society. Recession hits, the, Greek, the original New Deal happens, right? And we start to tax the rich at a fair rate. We start to organize unions where workers are making a, taking home a greater share of the, the product of their labor. And the inequality goes down, 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 down. Until about the time Ronald Reagan was elected, things started to turn around the other way. And that's the period that we refer to sociologists and political economists call the neoliberal era. This is the point at which we kind of abandoned government um, intervention in the markets to ensure fairness and full employment and focus instead on economic growth at all costs. So tax cuts for corporations, tax cuts for the rich, uh, not raising the minimum wage, busting unions, all of those things led to us coming back up to where we are now at the same point of inequality that we were right before the Great Depression where the 1% is again making 23% of all income. Next slide. The same is true with wealth. It's even worse with wealth. The concentration of wealth and the difference between income and wealth, of course, is income is money that you make from your labor, so it's a flow. Wealth is what you own, the value of everything you own, minus any debt, so the value of your home. That's the greatest source of wealth for Americans is their home, although most people are paying mortgages, so their wealth is not necessarily what they think it is until they pay off their homes. So the wealth is extremely skewed into the hands of a very small number of people. So all this to say, I, um, 
Yeah, okay, so I'll do this one real quick. This basically shows the blue line is the percentage of workers that are in unions, and the red line is the share of the wealth going to that top 1%. You notice a certain symmetry there, right? When workers are more organized and they have more power to demand more wages, they make a more equal society. More of the money is shared around among more of the people instead of all of it just going to the top. Okay, next. So the Green New Deal, the main thing about the Green New Deal for me, and we're missing part of this on the side, I apologize, is that it recognizes that all climate policy is inherently economic policy and social policy simultaneously, whether or not it explicitly says so. So a lot of the critique that you hear coming out of the Green New Deal is, oh, they're just trying to throw everything in there. It's a socialist wish list of everything that they want. No, the point is that Climate policy that does not address job loss, does not address shifts in the economy, nonetheless has an impact on those people. It's just choosing the winners and losers in a, in a way that benefits, again, the rich instead of sharing the burden more equally. So what the Green New Deal does is it acknowledges that climate policy is also economic and social policy and attempts to do so in a way that, like I said, shares the burden more fairly among all members of society instead of putting it just on the backs of the few. Next. Oh my goodness, this is getting worse by the minute. <laughs> Move the projector over. Move so, the projector. While you're working on that, working from my memory, I know what this says. In terms of the relevant parts of the Green New Deal resolution, and as Ed said, it's just, it's just like a visionary piece now, right? It's not actually legislation. Legislation is being drafted as we speak. Um, there's three main areas in which it talks about issues which I consider to be relevant to labor and workers. And those are the job creation piece, the just transition piece, and uh, this piece right here that I think is crucial to every stakeholder in the room is that it actually calls for all these different groups to have a voice in the crafting of the, of the policy and ensuring that nobody is left out of the process. So beginning with job creation, you guys can't see this at all, but I'd be happy to email it to anybody later. These are actually quotes from it that I pulled out of the actual resolution, and I, as a sociologist does, I kind of classified them and organized them. Um, but the main point is, the job creation hits on five big points. One is there will create many, many, many jobs. There will be lots of infrastructure work. These are good construction jobs. In a state like New Jersey, those are unionized construction jobs. Those are the best paying jobs that folks that don't have a college education can get in the state of New Jersey, right? Median income for a union construction worker is nearly $70,000 a year. So you can not go to college, go into the trades through an apprenticeship and make a nice middle class income by doing construction jobs. So there'll be lots of construction jobs. Um, the other point it makes is that there, we can't just have jobs, they must be good jobs. So it calls for prevailing wages and a living wage and uh, labor standards to ensure that workers are paid at least $15 an hour, et cetera, et cetera. All these provisions are important because one of the big critiques of workers that are gonna lose their job in the fossil fuel industry making 70, 80, $90,000 a year is that the green jobs such as rooftop solar suck. And they really do, they suck. And the reason they suck is because workers have no power in those industries. The fossil fuel jobs, the reason why they're good is because 60 years of worker struggles and unionizing and collective bargaining and fighting the bosses. 60 years ago, those fossil fuel plant jobs sucked, right? They were terrible jobs. It took workers building power over generations to make them into good, power, good jobs which is also what makes it that much harder for workers and their organizations to give up those jobs because of the legacy of their own activism, their parents' activism, and in the case of coal miners, their grandparents' and their great-grandparents' activism to make those lousy jobs into livable middle-class jobs. That's why it's so fundamentally, fundamentally important that we address that issue while we address climate change, right? Otherwise, you're gonna have a lot of resentful blue-collar workers that are gonna switch to the Republican Party for a generation at least and many already have with Trump's promises to bring coal back. So it's crucially important that we pay attention to that piece. Am I two minutes? All right, next. I actually went ahead to the next one, which is just transition. Next slide. Yep. <laughs> and we can go past that one too. So just transition I just hit on. Oh, and one thing I will mention from that is the healthcare piece we talked about. Yeah. That's absolutely not just an add-on. One of the main reasons why so many European countries have been able to act 
more, more rapidly on this, uh, on climate change issues, is because when you lose a job in America, you don't just lose your job. You lose your retirement, you lose your health care, you lose everything. If we had universal guaranteed in, uh, health insurance for everybody, if there were a single payer health insurance plan, losing your job, well, you would lose your wages, but you would still have access to your health care, your needed medicines, the health care for your children, which is a big piece of it. I'm a father, I have three kids. You know, one of the main things you look at when you look at a town to move into is how good are the schools, and when you look at a job, it's how good is the health insurance, right? We're, we're constrained, we're shackled to finding jobs that give us health insurance. If we decouple health insurance from employment, that creates a whole realm of possibilities, which is it's just fantastic to think about. All right, next. And I promise I'll be done in one minute. The final piece is that it calls for voice and having a participatory process. So in my own research, I have discovered that, you know, like I said, many European countries, the labor movement is more um, is stronger and larger, particularly in you know, the northern European countries, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, we all know the, the story there. Um, but in those countries, the labor movement also has a voice in policy formation. They have what's called this uh, tripartite governance, where the, the heads of business and the heads of labor and the heads of government together negotiate policies. And that allows for creating things like a just transition to be more feasible than in a country like the US where you see a gain for one group is essentially a loss for the other group. It's kind of a zero-sum political game here. If the boss wins, the workers lose. If the workers win, the boss loses. In the European context, when the three groups can come together and negotiate policy, you can find a, an agreeable solution. You can bargain, well, you're going to lose a little, we're going to lose a little, but we're all going to be collectively better off. So this is a crucial piece, having voice for everybody to have a say in, in the process. And finally, da, 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 why are these things important? Well, my academicness, I say there's a moral argument and there's a pragmatic argument. So the moral argument is that it's just unjust. It's absolutely unjust to solve the climate crisis on the backs of the workers who have spent their whole lives and their parents' lives producing the energy that we have all benefited from to have white collar middle class jobs, right? And they've been doing the dirty work of digging the coal and working the oil fields, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can live our middle class life and complain about them resisting us trying to get rid of their jobs, right? So it's just not morally right. So that's why we need to address the worker issue. And number two, it's a pragmatic argument. I would say that the only, the main reason we have never addressed climate change in a meaningful way is because if you don't take all of these other people's interests into heart, then you're creating enemies, you're creating opposition. Climate change is going to take a massive, broad base of support across all of the stakeholders in society for us to truly create, uh, to make this kind of radical transformation of our economy. If, if it's not everybody on board, then the people that are not on board are going to be the organized opposition to addressing climate change. So it's absolutely pragmatic and essential that we bring everybody into the fold, the union workers, the frontline communities, Everybody. Um, and I will leave it at that because I'm probably over by a minute. And thank you guys. And I have to apologize. I was not supposed to be here today. The 
director of, of in New Jersey Energy Alliance was supposed to be here, so I'm not as prepared as I usually am to give a presentation. I usually have slides, but I but I don't because I, I you know didn't think I was going to be doing this. I do the best I can. And what I will do is um, tell you the impression I have of the Green Deal, Green Deal, the new the Green New Deal, and then give you my worldview from an EJ perspective. How how give you my I'll tell you what my impression of the new the Green New Deal, and then give you my perspective from an EJ perspective of how I'm looking at it here, and so you can see the EJ world perspective. So my first impression of the Green New Deal is that there are good things in there, um, but it is aspirational. It lacks in detail. And uh, I say I work with EJ all the time. I do several things. I, I, I'm a member of several EJ organizations, so help keep them going. Uh, which is a big deal in the EJ community because we don't get a lot of resources, and also help help develop policy from the EJ, EJ perspective. Um, so you know, I'm kind of a policy walk. So I want to see the details. Um, I think it's good that it started uh, discussion around the country. I must admit, I've not taken it seriously yet, partly because I think it's aspiration, because I haven't seen the details yet, and I'm a bit worried. So now, let me give you the EJ worldview. Um, first thing I'll say, as an environmental justice person, my primary goal is not to protect the earth, not to protect the environment. My primary goal is to protect communities. Much like you talk about workers, my primary goal is to protect communities, particularly low-income communities and communities uh, of color. And much as the workers, sit on the back of the workers, there's one slide I've become famous for, or infamous for, that I show all the time. And since I, you know, didn't have much time to prepare, I should, it's in my bag. I should have pulled it out, right? But, <laughs> but it shows that, and this is why the EJ movement started, it showed that a disproportionate amount of pollution is in environmental justice communities. And that's true in New Jersey. The slide I show shows evidence that there's, a, that there's more pollution in low-income communities and communities of color than other communities. And what I start to say is that, to a large degree, if you think that the way we deal with environmental issues is sustainable, a large part of that reason, well, a large, um, uh, a large part of the reason it is sustainable is because that's sustainable for most communities is because of that disproportionate amount of pollution that's in environmental justice communities that largely goes unseen if you don't live there but it's not sustainable for those communities. So that's one context of my environmental justice worldview. Now, the next one is about climate change in particular. So I, most of what I work on um, is air pollution and climate change and something called cumulative impacts. The pollution, all sorts of pollution that you'll find in the neighborhood and the total amount of pollution in the neighborhood. And we come to climate change from a local air pollution perspective, we the EJ community. And at times, we fight with the environmental community. So environmental justice community, think of as mostly people of color, although we also include low, low income white communities. And um, several of our leaders in New Jersey come from those communities, or white folks come from those communities. We made them honorary people of color, whether they like them. We made them honorary people of color, whether they like them or not. Um, so, so, and when I say the environmental movement, I'm talking about mostly large national groups led by white folks. And climate change has been uh, a real point of division for us because we don't agree on how you address climate change. We don't agree on climate change mitigation policy, right? How are you going to stop climate change? The mainstream groups and, and most policymakers favor a system called carbon trading, and it's a market-based system. The environmental justice community does not like that because we want to use climate change mitigation policy to address the disproportionate amount of pollution in EJ communities. So you start to say, they say there are a lot of things in, in the new Green Deal, or the Green New Deal, Right. But we've been saying this for years from the EJ perspective, that 
we want to use climate change mitigation policy to address a disproportionate amount of pollution in EJ communities. You know, if we're going to fight climate change, we should less use it to make a more just society while we're fighting climate change. So we've been advocating that you have to integrate equity and environmental justice up front in climate change policy. And if you don't, you're probably going to make um, you're probably going to make those inequities that exist in our society based on race and income, you're probably going to make them worse, or at least perpetually. So we've been fighting over this climate change policy, where, where the EJ community is not EJ environmental justice, is not favoring carbon trading, is not favoring carbon tax, those are market-based systems, we're favoring regulation, regulation, and the mainstream groups and, and policymakers are. And in fact, People know what the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is, Reggie. Yeah. So um, our conservative governor, so that's a, that's a regional system, nine states, used to be 10, because New Jersey was in it. It's a carbon trading system. Our conservative governor pulled us out of it. Our progressive governor is putting us back in over the objections of the environmental justice community. Right? We, we, we don't want to go back in because, I think I said this, carbon trading, um, does not guarantee that you'll get emissions reductions in EJ communities. You might or you might not. So it does not guarantee that you're going to address the disproportionate amount of pollution in environmental justice communities. It might or it might not. And we don't think that's good enough. We don't think you leave equity and environmental justice up to chance. So we're not happy about going back in the region. And I'll, I'll, I'll just say, you see the differences. From the environmental justice point of view, we're not very happy with the new governor. And you can ask me more questions about that. But, you know, he, he, he needs to do more, the state needs to do more, and they have a chance. I might come back in two months and say, oh, okay, <laughs> we're, we're on the right track, but not right now. And similarly, with the Green New Deal, my worry is centered around, because I don't see those details, I don't know whether, whether the core of it, the core in fighting the environmental part, right, which is climate change mitigation policy, how are you going to reduce greenhouse gases? I don't know if that core is going to be a market-based system or not. And that worries me. Because if it's a market-based system, then at its very core, it's not what we would consider an environmental justice-friendly policy. So we're concerned about that. And what makes us even more concerned is that recently, Ed talked about transportation, um, that 40, 50% of the greenhouse gases come from transportation, and we haven't dealt with that. For example, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative doesn't deal with transportation. And there's a carbon trading system out in California. It doesn't deal, well, it, it actually does deal with transportation. But our, our system, you know, in the regional system here in the Northeast is not. And so rightfully, uh, the states want to deal with transportation. And what kind of system are they going to use? They're going to use a market-based mechanism. So again, over the objections of the EJ community. So you see a pattern. Right? And we don't like where this is going. So AOC, and by the way, I say because I view it like, you know, we're all overworked. And I was so, so overworked that I haven't been paying that much attention. I thought Lorraine was going to do this. I thought AOC was the Administrative Office of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said, no. I said, oh, OK. <laughs> I mean, I like her. She's very progressive. But I don't know, again, about, you know, the environmental justice community has been doing this for a while. We're versed in this stuff and doing this since the late 1980s. I haven't been doing it. I'm relatively newbie. I've been doing it almost 20 years. And don't, and you know, so the details matter. How do they intend to do the things that they say they're going to do in the Green New Deal? So that's what worries me. And you ask more specific questions. The last thing I'll say, um, then I'll sit down, is that Randy and I were having an inter interesting discussion uh, when we first came in. And we were talking about where, where the new Green Deal, Green New Deal came from. Um, and let me say, my assumption has been that the document we see in the resolution is really just a manifestation 
of a grassroots young people's movement. And, you know, that's kind of how it's been presented to me. You know, I've been on a couple panels. I was, uh, I was on a panel with one young man that was excited about it, and he was telling us about it, and, and I've made presentations where young people come up to me and, and talk to me about it, and I've heard about the sunrise, you know, kind of on the periphery. And so when I think of the Green New Deal, I think of that grassroots young people's movement. I, I, don't, I don't really think of, of, the, of the document. And so that actually gives me some hope. Because in my thinking, I, when I think about it, I'm thinking, wow, we got to get to those young people and talk to them. Right? We need to come together and learn about each other. You know, they need to know that there are old folks like me that have been talking about this for a while. And I need to understand where, where they're coming from. Now, we need to get to AOC, too. And some environmental justice people have. Although, initially, you know, the Green New Deal, no one was talking to environmental justice folks. So that's an important part of it, also. But for me, the more important part of it is to get to that grassroots movement and talk to them and have a common understanding of what we need to do. So I look forward to questions. I'll stop. Thanks again to all our speakers. Uh, I'm going to take a moderator's prerogative and, and uh, reflect on a couple of things that I've heard. And so we had three three good um, good speakers who each made different points. And so Ed talked about what needs to be done, the, the policies that need to that we need to implement because what we need to achieve is dictated by science. We know what we need to remove in terms of carbon from the environment, and it's pretty clear the strategies that we need to take. Um, Todd talked about the fact that. If we don't have a safety net and shared benefits and shared prosperity in this country, there will be winners and losers. And those losers, um, fearing, fearing the catastrophe of having that job taken away, will do everything that they can to, to fight against it. So until we have that broad shared prosperity, we're not going to be able to make big transitions in this country on anything. And then Nikki talked about the fact that even with broad prosperity, we have to be intentional from the beginning about understanding what the impacts on disenfranchised communities that are often excluded from broad prosperity. Um, so I think those are all perfectly relevant and the right, the right points. Um, I also think that um, hearing from Nikki is really interesting because I don't know about you, but you know, it seemed to me that the Green New Deal came out of nowhere and really electrified a lot of people. And I'm curious, how many people here were, are we're at some point super excited, super excited by the Green New Deal, just like a show of hands. Um, so that, that's quite a few people. And so there's not everybody, there's some people here who probably just want to learn more about it. And I think that's interesting. So someone like Nikki, who has been in the trenches working on these issues, working on social justice issues, um, civil rights for a long, long time, is sort of like, oh yeah, that Green Deal thing, right? Um, and I think it makes a, it's an important point about where leadership comes from today. We have kind of the conversation that's happening on the internet, and uh, whether it's left or right, you know, cable TV, and, uh, and then we have um, sort of the grassroots, people that are down in the trenches doing this work. And I think one of the, the, the things that you all need to think about is how do we bring those two things together. Um, and so that's it. So I'm going to open it up to questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll call on you. Uh, and then stand up and uh, introduce yourself. It doesn't have to be a question, you can make your own statement and then we'll, we'll comment on it if, if we want and uh, we'll have a conversation from there. So uh, yes, in the back in the blue shirt. And again, I'll, I'll remind everyone to please try to, you know, say what you have to say, but try to keep it uh, a little bit short because we want to we have as many voices as possible. Okay, thanks. Uh, this question is for Nikki. Uh, I guess I want to read from the Green New Deal and um, I, I guess I want to hear what you think about this. Uh, Whereas climate change, pollution, and environmental destruction have exacerbated systematic racial, regional, social, environmental, and economic injustices uh, by dispro disproportionately affecting indigenous peoples, communities of color, migrant communities, the de industrialized communities, uh, and youth. It goes on. Um, like I guess I, I was wondering, like, uh, does that address this issue, this issue that you that you brought up? Uh, give me the last question again. <laughs> well, I just uh, um, I was I was wondering if you could comment on this um, this section in the Green New Deal whether this addresses the uh, the issue of um, economic justice that you brought up. Yeah, 
it, 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 you, you know, the Green New Deal, if everything happened in the Green New Deal that it says, it would be great. And it, it, it talks about it, but it doesn't say how it's going to achieve it. And the devil, or I think the devil's in the details. And so that, that's why, you know, that's why I worry about it. Um, because, you know, until I see the details, because people that are in favor, you know, look, we can disagree on policy. People that are in favor of carbon trading say they're addressing those too. And we're like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, you may not be addressing them. And, and, and that's what makes me nervous. That, and, you know, if you talk to folks from the big greens, uh, big green envi environmental organizations, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, Sheets, we, 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 we agree with everything you say. But then when it comes down to the policy, we disagree. And so that's why, you know, I need to, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful but nervous. How about, uh, what does your organization stand on uh, HR 763, you cover the No, don't like it. It's a, it's a market-based mechanism, again, and the problem is it does not, we want to address the emissions. We want emissions reductions for environmental justice communities up front. We want that guarantee. We don't want a system that says, we're going to fight climate change, and we'll take care of the emission reductions for EJ communities later. And we'll take care of it through giving you money later. We'll figure it out. No, no, no. We want that figured out up front. They should go together. One should not happen without the other. I'll note that that is a really good example of what happens, Nikki's suspicion, of what happens when you don't have broad shared prosperity. If we lived in a country with universal health care, with universal income, um, where anyone could live wherever they wanted because they could afford to, you wouldn't immediately distrust that something that, had, that was good for the majority was going to be not good for everybody. Uh, and it just speaks to the inequities in our society generally. Okay, next question. So there was someone in the, in the uh, sure, um, I'm, I'm going to, Gail uh, Bittler, the mayor of Mount Park. Hi, everybody. So um, this question is really for you. Um, I deal with the DOT on almost a daily basis. We have a population here of uh, a little over 14,000 people, and yet we have close to 25,000 cars a day coming through Highland Park. Um, to be really committed to any kind of green deal or improving the environment in New Jersey, we need to have the, a consensus down in Trenton that says on every single board or commission, there is a representative from a sustainable um, New Jersey group, a complete streets group, someone that can bring the vision of what we're talking about here to the people who design only for highways. Um, I, you know, we, we, we have 60% of our population going into New Brunswick on a daily basis. And I can't seem to get through to the Department of Transportation the importance of making it safer for people to come down Route 27 by bicycle or foot to go into New Brunswick because they think transit is cars. And, and it's an uphill battle for us. The other part of what I want to talk about is we are talking about more e-vehicles. And that's a good thing. But to get to your point of social justice or environmental justice, electric cars are expensive. And it also means putting in more charging stations in convenient areas for all of our communities. How are we going to address the cost of moving to more e-vehicles from a social justice pr perspective? Uh, both great questions. I would just say, yes, I agree with you on the first part. It is definitely a problem. Um, with complete streets, making sure they're not only car friendly, that seems to be the main focus of any street, but pedestrian friendly and bike friendly. And then, you know, you didn't mention it, but I think 
it's part of how do we have public transportation? Is it affordable and reliable and hopefully renewable? Um, right. So um, we're terrible at that in New Jersey. You know, it's just you know, for my day job, I would love to take public transportation everywhere. Everywhere, I just can't. You map out my day, and there's no way to get between places. It just doesn't exist. Um, so. I, I think your suggestion of having local folks that are working on environmental commissions, uh, sustainable Jersey green teams, uh, is a really good one. And um, I, I want to mention that to the folks in transportation, particularly. Um, the second piece about uh, electric vehicles, um, it is true that in the past they are a high price point. But you're going to see in this year and through 2020 a whole slew of new vehicles coming out. These are not just Tesla Model 3s, which started, you know, at 35,000. Um, you know, you're going to see just basically Honda Clarity. You're going to see the Hyundai Kona, um, and the list goes on, which are the same price as a regular gasoline vehicle. In addition, it's good to know that electric vehicles are 80% more efficient um, as far as greenhouse gases. So even though they're using electricity, everyone says, oh, the electricity is coming from fossil fuels. That's how much less greenhouse gases they produce, even just off the grid. And a family with two cars would save 2000 a year on, on gasoline versus the electric versus gas price. So there is savings there, which speaks to the next part, how do we make them affordable for everyone? Um, and there is a bill moving through the legislature that provides more uh, rebates, um, particularly for uh, low and moderate income families. Um, and so that's one way to do it. And of course, we need to do more and it's the market catching up like right now solar is competitive with other ways to produce energy but 10 years ago that wasn't the case it needed subsidies and we're at a point now where subsidies for evs are important uh, particularly to make them affordable for everyone i don't know if anyone's added anything yeah um i i i don't i think that is important if you're gonna so so let me say um we're just starting to, we, the EJ community, is just starting to look at transportation policies now. You know, we're focused on um, the climate change mitigation policies, policies up and down focused on, on power plants. So for the last 10 years, we've been fighting that battle. So now we're, we're, we're being dragged into, we're being dragged into it, um, um, and somewhat dragged into it because, again, it looks like the framework for the nine, for, for most of the eastern states, for transportation work is going to be a market-based mechanism. Um, they call it capital investment. I'm not even quite sure how they define that. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll have to figure it out. But again, what are the implications for environmental justice communities, given that's going to be the framework that we're, the overall framework we're going to be working with. Now, so you talk about, um, I, I agree with you. If you're talking about, so preliminary thought, if you're talking about environmental justice, you, you shouldn't be focusing on private vehicles. Okay. Now, to the extent that you're going to try to get private vehicles electrified anyway, which you need to, then let's put the rebates in to make it more affordable. I don't think it's going to make a big difference, to tell you the truth, for vital just communities and affordability at the rate they're talking about, but it's a good idea. But if you're talking about justice in EJ, you, you have to start going after what Deb was talking about before, uh, school buses, right? Uh, school buses, uh, trucks, the transportation that goes through EJ communities. We have, we have to start focusing on, on that and not the private vehicles. And I'm not saying, you know, you got to do both, right? But, but for justice purposes, that should be the focus on getting rid of those diesel powered vehicles that are polluting so many EJ communities disproportionately. Great. Um, so can I just add one thing real quick to that? Yeah, yeah, please. I just also want to remind us of the, the New Deal part of the Green New Deal, right? I mean, it calls for a World War II style buildup of the American economy. It's calling for, to put it on the table, it's calling for massive government intervention into the economy in a way that we haven't done in decades in the United States. We're talking about Keynesian economic policy, not, you know, neoliberal pro market policy. So the investments in infrastructure, the original New Deal is what built the highway system that we have in the first place. The Green New Deal is what will build the next infrastructure of a more renewable, sustainable, and just system, and uh, you know, allowing everybody to have a voice in the policy formation 
Uh, I'm hopeful that the EJ committee will be a big part and have a very loud voice in that to make sure that we address those issues. Great. Um, and I think, you know, the Department of Transportation <laughs> and the arcane rules that engineers use and their inflexibility in changing is a classic example of why I think the framers of the Green New Deal are trying to frame this as a massive, you know, Green you know, New Deal, World War II style mobilization, where at that time they had to cut through layers of bureaucracy and cut through tradition and, uh, and it was a great time of transition and it was crazy. Um, and, but I think what they're trying to do is generate a sense of urgency that gets us to the point where everyone in society starts to realize that we're not going to be doing things the same way that we've always done them. Um, and, I, and I think it's an open question. Not everyone obviously agrees that um, we're going to get to that point. We have to have that kind of uh, sense of urgency. But that's what the Green New Deal is trying to do. Um, so this gentleman in the, uh, in the yes, in the polo shirt has been right, right, right behind you. So I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Thanks. I'm Alan Cooper. I'm a Highland Park resident. I am one of these people who commutes every day into New York from Highland Park. I choose to walk to New Brunswick Station and come back. That's good for me because I, I'm healthy, I've got a good set of legs. For many people, the issue of transportation is something that doesn't have to be, we don't have to wait for a huge uh, reimagination of the economy. We can simply do it by adding more buses, making public transportation more reliable, more regular, so that people can wait for the bus and know they're not going to have to wait more than 15 minutes to get a bus to go to the station and same coming home. That's what would cut down a lot of the car traffic and uh, that can happen right away. You know, it doesn't have to uh, be a special deal that uh, we have to um, have some kind of free community bus that will just drop people off at the station and then pick them up in the evening. Just have buses going back and forth and the economy will develop around that and people will get on the bus and go shopping and uh, I think that would be a, a great contribution. Yeah, I, I agree and I'll, I think that part of the point though is there's probably, uh, you know, there are scores, hundreds of thousands of things just like that, that all need to happen. And we need to, and each one of those things is simple in theory, really hard to do in practice when you're dealing with other human beings. And so how do we, how do we mobilize to create that broad societal change? Yes. What it does imply is that like other countries, but unlike America, our public transportation system needs to be seen as a cost of doing business, not as a profit center. If you're going to use public transportation as a profit center, and in order for it to spread everywhere it's needed, then it has to be turning a profit, it's never going to work. It has to be seen as a way of enabling people to get to good paying jobs, so they pay lots of taxes and pay for everything else. I've also noted that our road system doesn't turn a profit. So, uh, yes. Um, so, uh, right here. So, um, I've heard that Republicans are very happy about this resolution coming forward because they think there's a lot in it that they can use to um, sort of mobilize an opposition. And also, Democratic, mainstream Democratic leaders have not signed on in support. So, that's my concern about it. And I'm interested in reactions from the panel about why that is and, and yes. how we can get behind it and ignore that, that set of information that we're hearing that's concerning some of us. Right, and I think it's an open question as to strategy, right? So the, the two sides of the strategy are those who say, we need to win elections and we need to win the next presidential election more than anything else. Therefore, we need to choose a safe candidate. And there are other people that um, have noted, as in my opening, that um, the, the, the strategy that the Democrats have employed, essentially since, since uh, uh, the Clinton era, uh, the new Democratic strategy of triangulation, where uh, you, can, you move increasingly farther to the right um, to make sure you're not doing something that might be seen as controversial or scary, has closed the window of acceptable policy dialogue to the point that we're constantly debating Republicans on Republican turf. So um, I think that's still an open question, especially with the importance of the next election coming up. Um, and I don't know, do any of the other panelists want to comment on that strategy question? I, I think it's a great question. Um, I wrote down something I wanted to say, and the word is squirm. <laughs> it's good to make elected officials squirm, um, because you're asking them to do more than might be possible in this very minute, right? Because we don't. 
get big change by just asking for a little bit right now. And the question you bring up, where, like Republicans are gonna attack it because it has something in it to attack. They're gonna attack it even if there wasn't something. They'd make it up, right? <laughs> Death panels, remember that? You know, like they just make it up. And they're distracting from Trump's Russia ties. They're distracting from the cover letter on a 300 plus page uh, uh, detailed document. And it's just constant and um, I think to be bold and visionary, you have to just see the future and work towards that. And that might mean it makes people uncomfortable, both the elected officials at the top, and it might mean that the Republicans have something to attack Democrats on, but we need to push. That's why we're all here on a Thursday night when we could be watching must-see TV, right? <laughs> we need to make them squirm. That's our job. I am? It's not, it doesn't happen anymore? I do too many of these. I'll be very brief. I'm, I'll just say it's about damn time. What it is is it's a Democratic Party reclaiming its mantle as the party of the ordinary people. The party has shifted so far to the center that it's to the right. The Democratic Party of 2015-16 is the Republican Party of 1979. Right? The Democratic Party is what passed the first New Deal. Right? Single payer is something the Democratic Party wanted since the 50s. Right? We gave up on those things when Reagan won, and then the centrists and the Clintons took over, and they were all about, we got to act like Republicans so we can win. Half the country doesn't vote. Give them something to vote for. Democrats a political win. 
At the same time, progressive rhetoric surrounding the issue has contributed to a sense of urgency in the public dialogue, encouraging influential corporate lobbyists who support moderate solutions to address climate change, but want to avoid policies that include heavy regulations to act proactively. So I just want to say, a couple years ago, the idea that corporate lobbyists would be nervous about heavy regulations so that they want to come forward and support centrist policies was out of the question. Um, and just a couple days ago, March 25th, um, Republican Senator Omar Alexander proposed a new Manhattan project for clean energy to create breakthroughs in advanced nuclear reactors, natural gas, batteries, greener buildings, electric vehicles, cheaper solar power, and fusion. Um, he's calling for a doubling of federal energy research. And that's not what, what um, you all want. That's not what you all want. But no way would they be saying that. You know, no way would this be sort of on the table if it wasn't for the fact that someone was pitching the stake way out here instead of right here. So, uh, next. Yes, right here. Uh, I don't particularly have a, much of a question per se, but I just want to say a lot of us from Sunrise are actually here today. And anybody would love to invite you to a meeting uh, anytime. We usually have them on Mondays. We have one coming up on the first in Belmar at Surf Taco. Uh, thank you for the government and environmental justice um, you know, aspect of it, and we really appreciate that. And like I said, having your input in it you know, to kind of help us you know, kind of understand greater ways to address that aspect is uh, you know, great. Another concern I have, like I said, is labor unions. Um, I recently have been uh, involved in the fight against the North, uh, Northeast expansion supply pipeline. Uh, a lot of people out there who are against that are uh, really just labor union type people. And I kind of wondering what's an inroad that we can make personally grassroots? This is, it's a two part question. It's kind of both of you over there. I'd love to have you guys come to meetings. And um, like I said, my questions are kind of how do we mobilize on those fronts as activists? What are those steps to take? and both labor and environmental justice. So, so yes, um, first thing to say is the labor movement is not a monolith, so there are divisions even within the labor movement on this issue. Um, so if you look at unions like the SEIU or um, uh, the CWA, and some of the unions that are public sector workers or education workers or healthcare workers, service sector workers, they're far more progressive on the issue of climate change. Um, a lot of the construction unions, and, and I, I come out of one, I was a, car a union carpenter myself for five years. So, so one of the things that a lot of people I think don't understand is that section of the labor movement is so different from any other part of the U.S. economy because employment is intermittent in construction. So you get a job, you go build a skyscraper, you're working like 60 hours a week and then you get laid off and you're unemployed for like five or six months waiting for another job. Well, the union sector, what they do is they maintain their benefits and their same pay rank across multiple employers over their career. So they're able to uh, weather these periods of unemployment over an entire career so that they can get to a, a healthy retirement, usually with their bodies destroyed by the time they get there at age 60. But um, so that what that does is it makes one of the primary functions of unions in the construction sector is to drum up work for their members who are unemployed and saying, why the hell am I paying union dues? Where's the job? Where's the job? Where's the job? So, those kind of unions tend to support any and all construction projects. So if you're near the coast, go talk to them about offshore wind. They would love to build some offshore wind farms, right? What we need is some kind of guarantee that those will be good union jobs. The oil and gas industry figured out a very long time ago, very strategically, we're gonna promise the unions everything from now on and they'll be on our side on this. So you have unions that build pipelines, they've already signed contracts that every pipeline ever built from now till forever will be the best paying union job in America. We need the green companies to do the same thing and make the jobs be over there. So the construction workers are saying, hey, well, I can build wind turbines or I can build pipelines and they're both gonna be a lot of good jobs. Let's do the, then you can make the decision on a moral ground, not on an economic ground. Um, in terms of making inroads, that's, it's, it's, it's a really tough one. We should talk a little bit about it because that's really what I work on on a daily basis and it's very, very challenging. Sometimes it starts with very small, 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 small things. And I'm very delighted that Sunrise is here today. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, let's talk. I think it starts. It starts by talking, so we get to know each other. And you see where we're coming from. We see where you're coming from. Um, so you mentioned the Northeast Supply Enhancement Project, Messi. So I just wanted to mention Bernadette. Can you give a wave? 
Um, Bernadette's here from uh, Franklin Township. Where she's been extremely active, a number of us, uh, in opposing the compressor station 206 um, that would push the gas out through Raritan Bay to Long Island. Um, we think this project should be stopped. We think the governor has authority to do that. The decision's around the corner. And so she has a letter, if you guys can sign it before you leave. Um, and she'll take a copy and make sure that he gets it. And then it will, as well, an info sheet if you want to send comments in, if you haven't already, um, to the key decision makers at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Um, but this is a people power process, and we need all of you to raise your voices on this and on other unnecessary and dangerous uh, fossil fuel projects, totally contrary to the, what we're here to talk about tonight, the New Green Deal. Uh, one thing I'll notice that you know, when you think the union is a good example of why you really need to think big. Because the reality is if you focus in on one little project in one spot, um, you're not going to convince those union workers that they're not going to get hurt by that job not happening. Uh, and that's true. They're going to get hurt. Uh, but you, what you need to do is you need to think big. You need to talk about broad societal prosperity and the types of major legislation that are going to really work for anybody. And they have to be big and bold enough that people just don't think it's more incremental BS. That's not really going to make a difference. And I think that's also one of the lessons of Trump. Um, don't think small. Think really big. And I think the, the appetite of the country is ready for that. And there were a great number of people whose decision came down to Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump just because they wanted change. So think about that. Um, OK, uh, yes, you, sir. And then, yeah, and then we'll I, go to Mr. Peterson. I have a question and comment, but I'd like to answer the young fellow's question about how do we deal with that? And the answer is join Empower New Jersey. Don't fight just one pipeline at a time. And I spent at least two times at hearings on the Nessie. So I've done the, the individual one, but the way for him to deal with <coughs> pipelines at the union is to join Empower New Jersey. So that's the answer to his question that I think the people <coughs> here should know the answer to and have spoken about, because that's a New Jersey thing that's really important to us. I would like to, s to make my point now, and uh, this comes from a person that now resident in Highland Park. Her name is Naomi Klein. She says, climate change is more, isn't, isn't more important than any of these other issues, but it does have a different relationship to time. When politics of climate change go wrong, and they are very, very wrong now, we don't get to try again in four years. Because in four years, the Earth will have been radically changed by all the gases emitted in the interim, and our chances of inverting irreversible catastrophe will have shrunk. And I don't think personally, that the social problems of the United States are more important than stopping climate change, which will solve a lot of uh, adaptation problems for the majority of the world's poor. And if we don't stop global warming very fast, their life is going to be a lot worse than anybody's in the United States. And I open in for comments on that. Well, I've heard versions of this from environmental groups. Uh, and part of what you said, Sid and I have a of history. <laughs> Sid, part of what you said is true, I agree with it. I mean, we've got to stop climate change because it does hurt environmental justice communities uh, the worst, the first and worst, both in the United States and outside the United States. But, but, um, in fighting climate change, my fear is that if we do it the way that we're doing it now, and business as usual, you're going to exacerbate those inequalities anyway. And, you know, again, as people of color, we've heard before, I used to say this, but I say it now, hell, I'm old, I'm going to die soon anyway. Um, <laughs> That's not true. Well, I hope so. <laughs> but you know, we've heard this before in history. Well, we're going to form the United States, but we're going to keep slavery intact. Um, I think John Kennedy called at one point, I hope I'm not lying, I read the book a while ago. He called Martin Luther King and said, Well, don't protest now because the Russians will take, you know, the Russians will see this and they'll use it as propaganda. And Martin Luther King said, No, we'll. No. 
You know, we have to solve this problem now. Yeah. And you know, we're, we're at the point, I need to say as people of color, no, we're not gonna wait anymore. It's not gonna be, let's fight climate change now and we'll get the equity and justice later. Because who are you saving the world for? If you don't use climate change policy now to save this generation of young people, you know, you know if a young person dies now, that you could have saved by using climate change policy to fight the local pollution. When you save the world 30 years from now, they're just as dead. You haven't saved it for them. And if you don't lessen the inequalities while you fight climate change, and you save the world, and those inequalities are still there, or they're worse, you've made people worse off. Yeah. So you saved the world and made those people who have been marginalized already even more marginalized. So, you know, for us, we've got to do it together. Amen. And we're not, you know, we're, 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 we're saying, look, we're not accepting, we don't have the power to stop, but I'll just say that, you know, we, but we, we're not, to the degree that we can protest, we're not, we're not going along with, we'll save the world now and get to the environment, get to the injustice later. We're not, we're not accepting that. Yeah, that's right. I was also going to ask that, and I think, you know, this gentleman presented a particular framing suggesting that um, including all this social policy along with policies addressing climate would slow us down, make it less likely that we could achieve our goal. And it seems like the framers of the Green New Deal had a particular take on that. Right. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, first thing I'll say is in, in total agreement with what uh, Nikki just said, and I think that the phrase that would sum it up that we use in the labor movement is an injury to one is an injury to all. Right, and that's, that's what this is about. It's about taking care of everybody and not just throwing a certain set of people under the bus to do what's politically convenient at a moment. But I don't think it's politically convenient because as I said before, I think the pragmatic argument is we're not going to pass legislation that addresses climate change without also addressing all these other things because you're building in opponents, organized, politically funded opponents, right? You want to take on the, the AFL-CIO to pass climate change? Good luck with that, right? You want to take on the Business and Industry Society on climate change? Good luck with that. You want to take on the Environmental Justice Group on climate change? You're creating every political opponent in the world against your effort, even though your effort is presumably, I mean, I, we know your effort is, is of good intentions, but if you don't bring everybody on board in it and address their particular part of concerns that are related to it, you're not going to have the broad base of support that's needed to pass it and address the problem. That's what we've been doing for 30 years, right? Albert Einstein's definition of insanity, keep doing the same thing and expect a different outcome, right? That's what we've been doing. What you mentioned is what we have been doing, and it's going nowhere. That's the gentleman with the curly hair in the back. Uh, thanks, uh, David Hughes. Um, I have a question about natural gas. Uh, so the Republicans, some of them are positioning an alternative to the Green New Deal, which is promoting natural gas as a kind of a bridge fuel for the next millennium or something. Um, I don't know if we have a good answer for that in New Jersey, because what we need to do is take the handful of natural gas fired power plants offline. And what we prefer to talk about is about building wind turbines which don't actually cut carbon emissions, they add electricity generation, but we need to cut carbon emissions by cutting carbon emissions, which is to say stopping burning natural gas to generate electricity and to heat our homes and cook and so on. I, I don't see much of a conversation about that because, you know, that leaves people unemployed. That means shutting down an industry. So, and it is like the little mini coal debate uh, that we need to have here, which is happening in, in West Virginia, and not with very good results right now. So how do we get to a point politically in New Jersey where we can talk about actually shutting these plants down? Uh, I don't know that we're not there. Um, so just quick math, uh, by 2030, 50% of our energy production is gonna come from Class one renewable, solar and wind in New Jersey under the Clean Renewable Energy Bill. So 2030 from now, 11 years, about 5% right now. And then currently, 50% of the energy produced in New Jersey comes from nuclear, which has got no greenhouse gases. And 40% of the energy that's used comes from nuclear, that has no greenhouse gases. When you add 50% plus 40%, what do you get? 90%, which leaves 10% for other in the natural gas arena. That bill 
is closing down those plants. No, can I, can I stop you? You're measuring the wrong thing. It's not about grid density, because we can add gigaton or gigawatts of wind and solar, but that doesn't do anything to reduce carbon emissions. What we need to do is stop burning fossil fuels. Well, well when, so, the, so yes, it's actually more complicated than we probably can get into, because we belong as part of a grid to the <coughs> PJM grid. And, um, energy we produce is not always one-to-one -one energy we consume. So it, it's, these are really kind of complex issues. I don't mean to, to say that like we're, we're there or it's happening, um, but you definitely, we, we definitely are on that pathway. And the big problem with, and you know, the fossil fuel infrastructure, natural gas infrastructure, that's plaguing the metal ends power plant and other things, um, is once we build it, then the competitive system that we have continues to use it. And so there is definitely a need to, to stop that expansion and put our resources into the renewables. I, I mean, we could talk for a long time about the market metrics and all the systems that exist, which are quite complex, um, but New Jersey is on a, a really strong path. And I, I don't agree with you that the 3,500 megawatts of offshore wind is adding to carbon, so I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Well, I, I think that the, the grid and energy flows are complex, but there is some simple math. Um, new renewable generation does reduce greenhouse gas emissions by an equal amount, as long as overall consumption doesn't rise, right? And so there has to be an efficiency component, which of course is also in the green energy bill, um, and there's a lot of work um, going on to make sure that energy efficiency is happening at the same time. The, the, the bill actually required utilities from, in terms of the electricity grid, to come up with 2% annual um, consumption, you know, reductions in consumption or savings or increases in efficiency. 2% um, compounded a year is quite a bit. So that's happening at the same time we're adding new renewable generation onto the grid. Um, now there's, there's a lot of detail yet to be worked out. Um, so. Stay tuned, that's where, that's where the fight is. So I actually do agree with David's point. The plants do absolutely need to be closed. If we're gonna solve climate change, we have to stop burning fossil fuels. I mean, that's just like hard stop period. That has to happen. But that's why the, the just transition piece is so important to have in place. So when those workers are facing job loss, it's not just an abrupt loss of everything, right? So there has to be, and there are examples of this, case by case examples of just transitions in particular towns and regions where plants have closed. It's not like we're reinventing the wheel here. The town of Tonawanda, New York, just outside of Buffalo, coal plant town, it's the only employer in town. The whole town's tax base comes off of this coal-based power plant. That's what funds the public schools. The plant is phasing out. The public school teachers union actually became concerned because as the tax revenue was declining, they were gonna have to close half of their schools and increase their class sizes to 30, 40, 50 kids in a classroom because that's all they could afford. So those school teachers got together with a local climate justice group and an environmental justice group, and they went and they talked to the unionized workers in the plant, and they formed a coalition, and they reached out to the New York governor's office, and they got legislation passed to create the Fossil Fuel Plant Closure Act in New York State, which then gave a pool of money to the town to supplement the tax revenue as the business was fading out and its contrib contribution to taxes was eroding. The state kept this tax, tax base level and then the community created a committee to democratically decide what they wanted to do with their economy for the future. They were gonna employ the workers who worked in the plant to dismantle and take down the plant, turn it into a park. They decided what kind of new economy they wanted to create. They were gonna have some kind of eco-tourist aspect where people could come and, and do kayaking and things like that in the lake. And they just basically they use their democracy to subvert capitalism and put the interest of people before the, before the profit interests of corporations. And, and that can be done at a local scale, at a state scale, at a national scale. It just requires creativity, bravery, and vision, which I think the Green No Deal is providing for us and young folks in the Sunrise Movement are leading us into that direction, thankfully, and shining the light on it. We just gotta be brave enough to do it, and, and I think we will. Tonawanda. Tonawanda. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and after saying that, there, there was some simple math. I also want to go back, though, and say that there are some complex interplays that happen when you think about our energy supply. So everyone's talking about electrification of vehicles. 
what is that going to do? That is going to radically spike the amount of electricity that we consume. We're going to have to create more electricity in the short term to produce um, the oil that we burn in those cars. So um, can we, at the same time, that we need to produce a lot more electricity to displace that oil, um, shut down those natural gas plants? I really don't know. Um, and I'll also, you know, and, and not like freeze in the winter. I don't know. That, so that's, but there's a real, a real constraints there. I'll also note that, um, you know, uh, I won't name the town, but the town in New Jersey went onto the, the market and bought greener energy than comes from the grid. Um, greener by essentially meaning a higher percentage of the energy um, was class one renewables. So there's the, you know, by law, a certain percentage of it, roughly 20% right now, has to be renewables, and they were buying like 30%. What they didn't realize, though, was because they were buying it from the market, they were buying it from a supplier where the rest of it was coal. If they were just buying it from the New Jersey grid, it would be 20% renewables, a bunch of nuclear, um, and then uh, a bunch of natural gas. And it was much cleaner and had a much lower carbon footprint than the 30% renewables. So um, we're going to be generating more electricity oh, um, that will ultimately lower the carbon intensity of our lives, but I, I'm not an expert. I honestly don't know if you know what we can shut down and what we can just turn off in the short term in terms of these various energy spigots that are leading into the state, um, and then not not die. And to Nikki's point, you know, ultimately this is about um, um, the future of humanity, and you know, kill some people today because they froze, kill some people in 20 years. So um, I think that also gets to a question though of trust and transparency in government because. Who do we trust that's really going to be telling us the straight answers and doing the type of analysis that needs to be done? Um, right now in our current system is you have sort of dueling lobbyists and outgunned government officials um, telling us different stories. And I think for, you know, there's a lot of people that really don't trust the answers. So um, there, there are some, if we're going to make big transitions, there are a couple things that really need to happen. One is broad prosperity and no losers. Another one is, you know, sources of uh, information that we can all trust, and that's something that's sorely lacking in this country right now. So, uh, other questions? Yes, right here. Um, no, uh, yeah. Where does this um, Green New Deal stand in Congress right now? Has it been brought out to committee at all for discussion? No. <clears throat> um, so, so it was um, in, in the Senate, it was, it was introduced, I don't know if um, it went through committee or it came to the floor yet. In the Senate, um, they brought it right to the floor for a full vote, and uh, essentially the Democrats boycotted it. Um, they, they, they all voted present um, because they, they felt that it was a, a scheme by the Republicans to try to get them to argue amongst themselves and have people in vulnerable districts go on record. Um, and so it lost. Uh, by quite a number of votes. And there were four Democrats that actually voted against it. The rest just kind of were present. Um, I think it was debated on the House, but I'm not sure if it was in committee. Uh, but so. But can it be brought up again, or where does it stand right now? Well, it, yeah, th these things don't go necessarily go away. It's a question of whether or not the leadership decides to move it forward through the committee process and bring things up for a vote. I think there's a big debate that has to happen um, among Democrats, among, uh, you know, here. To determine what's you know what is going to be the positioning of the party, how bold are they going to be? Um, I can tell you that Frank Pallone, um, our congressman, is the uh, the chair of the Energy and Environment Committee. I don't think he supports the Green New Deal. I think he thinks it's Pollyannish. Yes. Um, and uh, you know, so he, you're his constituent. You can tell him what you think. But we should all be making phone calls. And yeah, I mean. He, he's, he's, a, uh, he's a congressman from one of the safest, sort of bluest districts you can get. Um, you'd expect him to take a bold position. So, um, yeah, in the back. And then I'll come up to you, sir. So, uh, actually, uh, Nikki, you mentioned that 40% of um, greenhouse gas emissions comes from transportation. I don't know if you were aware that there's a bill in the California legislature, it's SB 50, 50. Um, their idea is that by providing more affordable housing near public transportation, they'll greatly reduce 
the amount of transportation that's needed for people to get to their jobs. They also want to try to do that in places where people can be right in the same community as their job. Um, because the average commute time in California is apparently something like 90 minutes one way. So, um, I, if you're not aware of that, I suggest you check into that. That, that might be useful. Um, since they have uh, an affordable housing problem in New Jersey, that might be something that the state might consider here too. If you think that's a good idea. What do you think of that? Um, so, I am... So it does sound like a good idea to me, but um, one thing we're, we're doing is that actually I'm going to a meeting next week in, in New Mexico, national meeting, EJ folks and uh, big green folks. And uh, the big green folks, environmental folks, have been working on transportation issues for a long time. And the person for um, NRDC, Natural Resource Defense Council, has been bugging us. Uh, and he's the head of their transportation policy out of California, has been bugging us to listen to him <laughs> about what they're doing out in California. Um, the last contact I had with California EJ transportation policy was about five years ago. One of our largest EJ groups called CBE, Communities for a Better Environment, is out there. And so what we're going to do, when I say we're just starting with the EJ transportation policy, we're going to check in with the EJ folks out in California to see where they stand on what's out in California what's ha and, and what's happening in California, where they stand on it. But we're also going to go to the mainstream green groups and talk to them about what they've been doing and um, also about, you know, they have um, less than 5% of the funds that go to environmental issues go to EJ groups. So a group like NRDC has a multi-million dollar um, budget and they can do they can do a um, modeling thing and things like that that we can but in working together uh, we think we can get them to do modeling for us and, and, and other kind of more technical things we don't have the money to do it so we can really delve into these policies. So it sounds good to me thanks for bringing it up and that's exactly the kind of things we're going to be looking into as we're developing EJ transportation policy. There was an article in the New York Times recently that pointed me to that. Um, I can even send you a pointer to it if you want. I'll note that smart growth, um, the, the idea of compact urban development that has houses that share walls and are more efficient and people live in smaller spaces but they've got better common spaces like the local coffee shop and they can walk and walk to work or drive smaller distances is something that has been part of the bucket of climate solutions for a long time. But I can tell you at the national level, um, among sort of think tanks, um, there is a sense that those land use changes, um, urban renewal, urban redevelopment, they take too long. Um, and they won't come online fast enough to really stave off the crisis at hand, um, whereas electric vehicles, we can sort of, we can get them going in you know, five years, let's say. Um, so we're, we're going to take uh, one last question. Um, and so I, I want to try to pick up a, a, a young person because it's been <laughs> Sorry. Um, but they're the ones who have to live with our mistakes. So. All right. Yeah. How about we take a couple questions real quick and then we'll let the panel respond. So can you, can, do you have a quickie? Or do you have a speech? <laughs> Great point. And decommissioning these plants that now you're stuck with paying for the decommissioning. Well, it's a tough issue. And, and I, don't, I don't think and th there are a lot of people that um, care about these issues greatly and just don't agree. Uh, yeah. And, and, and it's a horrible choice to have to make between climate catastrophe and nuclear power. Um, but it'll be made. Yeah, really quick. I've been having my hand up for a long time, so I'll make it really quick. Thank you. We've been considering putting solar panels on our house. And one of the issues, you know, when you're talking about EV you know, uh, vehicles, uh, electric vehicles, and one of the issues about putting solar panels on your home is that it's you know, whatever kind of 
rebate or whatever kind of incentive government gives you is based on your historical use of electricity, not on the electricity that you would use if you were going to have electric vehicles. Where does the government stand on expanding that incentive so that people could put more uh, solar panels on? I, I, I understand the question. It basically, it's a, it's a technical question and a technical answer, but you know, the government limits how much, how much solar you can put on your roof. I think you're going to get rebates to the amount that your house actually consumes, and if we're talking about EVs, then we have to expand that. Hopefully, I don't, I don't think any of us have the answer to what they're doing right now, but that, eventually that's going to have to come up. And uh, this young woman over here, you had your hand up in the red. I also feel bad because he's had his hand up for like past like half hour or so. <laughs> so if you want to say something, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Why, don't, why don't you both go take turns? Okay. Then, how we um, well, hi, I'm Katie. I'm from Rutgers University. And I was wondering what role universities like Rutgers are playing right now. And so I was just wondering what role universities like Rutgers are playing now in the broader scheme for New Jersey and moving forward on climate change and how they can do better because I don't think that they're doing enough to lead the way. And I think we have so much research power and capabilities and so many passionate people, but it's just all over the place. And I was wondering your perspective from the outside because we're kind of in a bubble right now. Any quick responses? And I think a lot of us have, have real work with folks at Rutgers all the time on all these issues, right? Um, I mean, I would say like the divestment strategy is a good one. Um, and I don't think Rutgers, Rutgers has gone there, um, but that sends a clear message about where we're making money to support the university. So I would say that you can also intern with a lot of our organizations. We have a lot of Rutgers interns. I'm a double grad, so we'd love to have you. Uh, one thing that's true about higher ed in general, especially universities, so they, uh, uh, they, they, don't, they favor faculty that publish publishes research that often is not super practical, and the faculty that sort of get their hands dirty working with local community groups and you know working on statewide issues, um, it's sometimes hard for them to get tenure, and they really have to start valuing um, the faculty that are using their expertise to help solve problems. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's a good one. And one, um, I, I think the resource we, we probably need the most from universities are students, because we need young people with new ideas and, and one of the do stuff that the older folks can get uh, gifted in our ways, and, and we won't do it. Um, for me, I, I did want to say something you know, along with what Randy was saying. Um, the universities, with respect to EJ, a lot of times have had bad relationships with EJ groups because universities would come in and start doing research on EJ on environmental justice and take that money that might go to an environmental justice group on the ground. And then the universities become the EJ centers, and they start to find environmental justice. So, for like in my job, I work at a university, but one reason why my center is so small, I am the center, is because I have never asked for money for my center, because New Jersey EJ Alliance has trouble getting money. So I said, how can I ask for money if the if the grassroots group I'm trying to work with can't get it? And so, you know, how how do we? And the university is getting better, but that's been one. One hurdle we've had to overcome. Can I just take my one second of response and give it to the gentleman right to the right of the woman who just asked because he did have his hand up all night. <laughs> you. you want to make a comment? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, thank you. Because <laughs> I can see you raised your hand since the very beginning. My name's Safi Kadavik. I'm with Green Muslims of New Jersey. We're a grassroots um, organization that seeks to put together activists at the community level. Um, one of the things that we do is we do uh, religious-based education for uh, developing eco-conscious and sustainable practices within our community. Um, we are in the church, and uh, the voice of the religious community with regard to the international agreements, Laudato Si, and all the various declarations on climate change was a powerful voice. One of the things we're doing is we're do working at the grassroots level with regard to, like I said, environmental practices, religiously based, and we're also plugged into Green Faith, which is a Highland resident here. Um, but what my question goes to this aspect is we're seeking to green our practices internally within our faith communities. Um, and then we begin to say, okay, now we've got to move to the area of advocacy, not just protest, but advocacy. The Green New Deal, how does that impact 
the various other programs, po uh, policies that are being put forth at all different. We mentioned some of the market pro uh, policies like the uh, carbon tax and so on and so forth. In other words, where do we focus the attention? We have limited resources, time, money, uh, human resources, capital resources, etc. And it seems there's a lot of a lot of leaks in the dike, and we have to put more than ten fingers in it. So um, I guess my, my question is: if someone mentioned the idea of cumulative impacts. How do we? Is this worth the time and the effort and energy to push this Green New Deal forward through our legislators? Or are other policies going to be negatively impacted and how, so we can best channel the limited energy that we have, be it human resources, financial, and so on and so forth with regard to these issues? And that's, a, that's a great closing question because it's sort of like where we put our energies and what do we do? <laughs> um, so for me, the answer is so far it hasn't been. That, that's why I, I said I haven't, you know, I haven't paid the most attention to it because I'm so far behind on all my other work. Um, the, 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 it's been interesting, and well, I've kind of observed it from afar, and worry about the case you're talking about to other policies. But so so far, it, it, you know, I haven't put efforts there. Um, I will put more efforts there, though. With young young folks, you see in the audience have their own grassroots movement. Since we're trying to be a grassroots movement too, talking to them and working with them. Um, would be worth the time. But there's a document now that's in Congress, you know, you know we're kind of, what do you call it, wait, uh, patient, not, we're, we're watching it, you know, to see what, what happens, or I'm watching it to see what happens. Um, I'm not gonna pretend to have the answer. It's a fantastic question, and I think it's the one that's kind of on everybody's mind. But uh, my understanding is that, you know, you have the little Dutch boy trying to plug the hole in the dam, I think is what you're trying to help me visualize there, but then there's another hole, there's another hole, there's another hole. What the Green New Deal says is, well, we, we can't just plug one hole at a time. We actually do have to fix the whole dam thing, right? <laughs> you have to fix the whole dam. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to tell you what I think you should do. Um, I, I am putting my energy behind the Green New Deal because I think we need to fix the whole thing. Ed, do you want to comment on that? Closing word? Um, don't forget to see Bernadette and sign the petition on Nessie. Um, there are a lot of things people can do with their time. Um, you know, I think you have to look at what you're looking for in the short term and what you're looking to gain in the long term. And Randy mentioned this before, but you know, some ideas that five or six years ago didn't seem palpable today are part of the discussion and closer to reality. And so I always say there's two kinds of people. There's people that ride the waves and the people that make the waves. And there's a time sometimes that you do one or the other. And I think the New Green Deal is about making a wave. And someday people are gonna get on board and ride it together to make this country better. Great, and then for the, the thank you all for the panelists and um, for our, our closing word, we'll turn it over to our host, who also is a representative and an organizer in an organization that is trying to enact some of these things. So, thank you very much. Could we give a very hearty round of applause for our speakers? Uh, and thank you for so carefully moderating the discussion. And to you yourselves for really very interesting questions and perspectives. So, thank you.